Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to The Real Economy. I'm Darby Dunn, your moderator for today's webcast. Pleasure to be with you all. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the real economy, as well as the tight labor mo market, COVID, and the effects of the pandemic on the workplace. Joining me from New York is Joe Brusuelis, RSM's chief economist. Hi, Darby. Hi, Joe. Good to see you. And Neil Bradley of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce joining us from Washington, D.C. Neil is the chief policy officer and head of strategic advocacy. Great to see you both. Thanks for joining me. We appreciate it. It's good to be with you again. Uh, I want to tell everybody who's in the audience to enter your questions in the chat. You can start entering questions right now if you like or as we go. And I'll try to monitor them and um, ones that are related to the topics we're talking about. I can bring them in right away. Mention your first name, uh, what sector or business you're in and your city or region. And that will give us a little more uh, color and try to best answer your questions. Uh, as I mentioned, our focus today is the very tight labor market. So let's start off with that. And uh, let's start off with you, Joe. Um, when I watch uh, business news, read the headlines, the descriptions of the overall U.S. economy is that the economy is strong, although there are these big concerns about inflation being at a four decade high. But describe for us uh, from your research the state of the real economy, the middle market economy. How would you describe it at this point? Well, you might describe it as boomflation. We have an economic boom going on amidst uh, a post-pandemic adjustment in inflation. You know, look, the way I look at it is April 2020, we're down 22 million jobs. Policymakers at, at the Federal Reserve and Congress and the administration really had no choice other than an attempt to reflate the economy. Okay, for the first time in, in my career arc, we used the fiscal channel and it worked. However, we're now going to have to deal with the unintended consequences of that. And that means higher than inflation than anybody wants. And it's got it's a composition of both demand and supply. The supply shock we know about supply chains, but demand's been unusually robust. And in part, that does have to do with the labor market that's just on fire. Over the past three months, we've added 541,000 on average each month to total employment. Employers are having a very difficult time adjusting to what's a real regime switch with respect to the availability and willingness of workers to work at what was the pre prevailing wage prior to the pandemic. Clearly now that's changed. So we're, we're moving in a very different direction, but here's the thing. If you're in the real economy and you're looking at the past two business cycles, it took eight and 10 years before we moved back to full employment. We're gonna do that in less than three. We're already back above the pre-pandemic level of overall act economic activity, and that was done in less than a year. So what that means is the economy is going to be in a pretty good position here to absorb the inflation. The Fed's going to begin raising rates, and the Fed can absorb that too. I want to make sure out there that we don't fall into one of these either-or false dichotomy arguments. Simply because the Fed's raising rates doesn't mean it's going to derail the economy or crash the economy on purpose. What it means is we got to get the policy normalization out of the box. It's got to get moving and it's going to get moving quite quickly. There'll be a mixture of conventional and unconventional tools that the monetary authority will address. And then because we don't expect anybody to raise taxes, which would be the most obvious way for the fiscal authority to cool the economy. We're going to have to take a look at the composition of inflation. And I think what we're really going to be talking about for the next couple of years is the cost of shelter in general and owner's equivalent rents in particular. Owner's equivalent rents up 4.8% on a 12 month annualized pace. We haven't built enough homes since the great financial crisis. Depending on how you measure it, we're short anywhere half a million to 2 million. We need to begin building homes. That is one way the Congress and the administration can directly signal the American people that they understand the difficulty adjustment that they're facing that inflation from housing is not only persistent, but it's sticky and it's going to lag a bit. So it's going to rise here, even as overall inflation will not look as bad in a couple months as it does now. But I think as we look forward and you're concerned around the real economy, that's where the next big, I think, policy step comes from. 
but we got a 4% unemployment rate. We'll be well below 3, 3.5% by the end of the year. And I even think real wages will see a modest increase by the end of the year as top line inflation eases off a bit. So the real economy in a boomflation period. Uh, Neil, one of the things that employers are having difficulty with is finding workers to fill jobs. Uh, we hear a lot about the great resignation. You call it the great reshuffling. Uh, tell us what you mean by that and what you're seeing. Well, you're exactly right. It's, it's a reshuffling and a resignation. You might be able to combine both of them at this moment. Um, you know, Joe talked a little bit about the, the unemployment rate, and that's the good news in terms of uh, the ability of those who are seeking work to find employment. There's plenty of jobs out there. One of the things that we're paying close attention to at the chamber, though, is the, the workforce participation rate. We saw uh, finally a, a nice jump in workforce participation uh, in the January jobs report, but we need to sustain that trend. You know, just by way of comparison, if you take our current population, and you applied the workforce participation rate that we had pre-pandemic to the current population today, we'd have about four and a half million more people uh, in the workforce, which means it would be a lot easier uh, to fill those open jobs. You know, we often get asked, like, what, where did those people go? What, what happened to them? And it, it's a whole bunch of different stories. It's as varied as the American experience, right? According to some research, there's about 2.4 million more retirees above trend line today than where we would be if we'd have been on uh, the same path pre-pandemic. Um, working uh, parents, in particular working mothers who are having a real difficulty with schools being opened and more importantly, childcare being opened. There's about 1.4 million fewer working mothers in the workforce today. And you know, people forget about the fact that uh, legal immigration uh, was in many ways closed up during the pandemic. There's some research just out uh, about a week or so ago that there's about one million fewer college educated immigrants in the country today than what we would have had but for the pandemic. And so you add all those things up and it's a lot of things for employers to work through uh, as we figure out how to fill those open jobs. When employers or businesses think about what they need to do to attract and to retain workers, uh, one thing that stands out to me um, from research that RSM and the Chamber has published is that they better embrace hybrid and that hybrid is here to stay. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that, Jeff. Sure. There needs to be much more flexibility in workplace arrangements and workforce arrangements in, in the American economy going forward. It not only means you're going to allow people to work at home, it means you're going to provide them with that technology, which, by the way, is unleashing a productivity boom as we speak. So firms are, are, are going to have to be quite nimble here as we emerge into this new post-pandemic phase or what I call an endemic, right? When we're just all going to live with it. My sense here is, is that not only do you need to be quite a bit more flexible, you need to widen the search of, of the workers where you normally find them, right? Things are going to be challenging for a while. Neil very, very smartly laid out all of the different problems around uh, the labor force participation rate. We've had a real structural break in the number of employees that are in the workforce who are age 55 and older. You know, it's, it's where we took casualties. It's where technology may be a, a bridge too far for some of those workers. So you're going to have to look in the lower age cohorts, and they've got a very different view about the relationship or the work-life balance, and they're going to make different demands. So I think looking forward, you should assume there's not going to be any immigration reform coming. I'm not holding my breath on it. That would clearly be the, the, the quickest way to, to solve this problem. Absent that, it means more technology. And in some cases, for some firms, it means substituting technology for labor in order to meet demand, increase efficiencies, and boost overall output. I think as we move forward, because the growth of the American labor force has slowed to about two-tenths of a percent per year. That's well below the 1% average during the post-World War II period. Um, labor supply is just going to be an issue going forward. Yeah, I, 
one of the things I've been struck by is um, that businesses have thought a lot about what value pr proposition they bring to their customers, but have they thought a lot about what value proposition they bring to their employees or to the people that they want to recruit? It seems to me that it's a new game now. It's a new uh, era and that that's something they really have to think deeply about. Would you agree, Neil? Oh, oh, absolutely. And I think you have to, you know, Joe said you have to cast your uh, recruiting net wide to look about where you're going to get employees. He's exactly right about that. I also think you have to think widely about the workplace benefits that you're providing. Um, you know, Joe was spot on on the flexible workplace and the ability to work remotely. But I think that also uh, extends to, to benefits and to the things that employers are offering as they uh, work to attract employees. And I think it should cause them to think a lot more about the tools that are out there and frankly, including incentives, you know, in the tax code. We've become an evangelist here at the chamber uh, for some of the provisions that were extended or enacted by Congress tax provisions during COVID that just didn't get a lot of attention at first. You know, for example, uh, the ability if an employer is providing student loan payments uh, for their employees. By the way, there's a lot of non-college graduates who have student loans who often are the ones struggling the most to make those payments, and it doesn't count as income for uh, the employee. That's a provision Congress enacted. There are tax benefits if you, you know, if you have a lot of working parents, um, you can uh, uh, get a credit, tax credit for uh, providing daycare benefits on site. If you're not able to do that, you can actually uh, get another credit for helping your employees find daycare assistance somewhere else. And so I think if you, you know, smart employers are thinking about more than just uh, the traditional uh, wages and retirement and health care. They're thinking about the problems that their potential employees have, whether that's <laughs> debt, whether that's a flexible workplace, whether that's uh, children uh, in need of care, and they're designing packages around meeting those needs. And should employers be thinking about letting more jobs be part-time jobs? A lot of parents, mothers in particular, would be very happy to do a part-time job when their children are young. Uh, but most in the past, the, the jobs were either full-time or you don't get the job. Do you see any changes in that respect? They, they absolutely should be looking at that. And they should also look at you know, the, uh, the qualifications that they have on jobs. You know, uh, oftentimes employers don't uh, reevaluate uh, the qualifications for a job that maybe they've had for a long time. And maybe they set the qualifications, for example, a, a college degree um, or certain experience that may have made sense when the labor market wasn't so tight, but is really cutting off a huge pool of potential employees. And the qualification that you're advertising may not really be relevant in the same way that a job may be able to be done part-time rather than full-time. And you just have to re-examine all of those assumptions that you've had in the past as a way of kind of confronting this challenge. Joe, you know, go ahead, in, Joe. In the past 30 years, we've all learned to work globally, which means you, you have to be very flexible in terms of when you're conducting your work and where. And I think that we can learn something from that experience. We shouldn't look at the traditional workday as just 8 a.m. to 5 anymore. I think I'm so, and I'm somebody who's got a, an active global team um, with people all over all over the, the world, and it, you know you just can't approach this the way you would have circa 1985, right? And what's really critical is the growth in labor force is female centric, and we need to accommodate that, which means we have to make some changes, right? You don't have to have your meeting at 8 a.m. every morning. There are w different ways in which we can go about that so that there's an inherent flexibility around time constraints because of work-life balance and family. And, and Neil's just spot on. We, we really have to put in the correct type of incentives in order to draw these people back into the workforce, because if we don't, there'll be a ceiling to how fast we can grow, and there'll be constraints around the quality of growth. And this is absolutely critical. We have to hit the mark on this one. Joe, you mentioned the 8 a.m. meeting, have some flexibility around that. Does it really have to be on that 
at that time. I'm curious what you think about, what about putting caps on the number of meetings? Should employers think about doing that? You know, maybe two meetings a day, the rest just do it email or phone calls, because that's a big complaint among workers that they're just sitting in too many meetings. Okay, so I hear I hear what they're saying. And as an economist, I'm always for more efficiency, less meetings, less calls. We use uh, Bloomberg, so we've got the chat rooms. Now, there's a trade-off there because, yeah, you'll have less meetings, you'll have less calls, but it's also 24-7, right? I've got a group of economists. They know coming in, well, it's a 24-7 job, right? You're always on the job. That's not appropriate for everybody. There are some technological solutions. There's something called Slack that's a very uh, useful way to engage in communication that can reduce the number of calls, that can reduce the number of those meetings. But again, you may be sitting there at the dinner table with your, your toddler while you're looking at your phone and you're on Slack. And some people may not necessarily like that trade-off. I can tell you that I've talked to many people who are over the age of 55, and that's one of the reasons why they've exited the workforce that they just didn't like how the technology permeates their their lives and has invaded what they do. So it's going to be company by company, and you really have to be in touch with your workforce. And again, that's one of the management challenges here. One of the things that the chamber recommends, uh, I think it was three uh, pronged, adapt, invest, find workers in overlooked pools. I'm talking about uh, investment, Neil. Um, investing in automating those activities that workers find uh, soul crushing, boring, deadening, that seems to be a good way to go uh, because workers are looking for career growth and now they're in the position where they're in demand so they can really push for that. Yeah, that's exactly on the investment side. That's exactly right. And I think too often we've made discussions about investment, particularly investments in technology is, is somehow it's a binary choice that you're either going to have a person or you're going to have a, a piece of technology or, or a robot. It doesn't really work that way. Right. You know, uh, Darby, you talked about working you know, part time. Well, one of the ways that we can help employers can help people work part time is by automating more of those mundane tasks that they would otherwise be doing uh, if they were working full time. Um, you know, Joe talked about working remotely. Well, one of the ways that you empower people to, to work remotely, either 100% of the time, or as we're increasingly hearing from, from our members at the US Chamber, uh, a portion of every work week, is that you give them the, the technology to be able to, to work from anywhere. And so um, employers have got to be willing to make those, and I think they are willing uh, to make the investments work to adapt uh, to the new labor force, the new realities, and frankly, the new expectations of employees. I heard something interesting that I didn't know uh, before recently, um, that 50% of job seekers are applying for jobs on their cell phones. Uh, so that's something that employers should look at. Make sure that that's all working correctly. Make sure they have that in uh, in the works that people who are looking for jobs can apply in their cell phones because that's how everybody lives now with that thing in their hand looking at it all the time. Well, sure. I mean, we get, all of our platforms are moving to mobile compliant and mobile consistent, right? Now, that's going to be a challenge for smaller firms, right? I mean, we understand that RSM really services mid-market and some larger firms. And they're going to be okay, but I do worry about uh, smaller firms and their ability to compete for labor and compete in the market because moving to mobile is, is challenging and can be extremely challenging if one doesn't have the financial depth. But that is, you know, Neil pointed that out. I mean, we have to get ready for the world that we're going to inherit, not the one in which we used to work for. You know, Darby, you mentioned platforms. I, I would talk about another piece of friction here. So um, one of the things, and we actually have a, a program where we're working with employers at the U.S. Chamber and some of the platforms that people are using on their mobile devices and elsewhere to find jobs is, the terms that employers use to describe the skills that they're looking for and the terms that employer, potential employees use to describe the skills that they have, often there's a huge mismatch in that. Mm -hmm. And so employers are missing potential employees 
and potential employees are missing job openings because we're not talking in a common language. And the more recruitment and application we do, as you pointed out, you know, through our phones, uh, the higher the cost of, of, of that friction. And so there are things uh, as simple as figuring out uh, what words you're using to describe the skills that you're recruiting for that really can make a difference. I have a college age daughter looking for summer employment and I look at those websites and the job descriptions and openings quite a bit. And they'll even pop up and say, oh, your resume doesn't have those words in it that this job is seeking. So a lot of it's a computer algorithm just matching up the words. And as you said, Neil, it could just be a big mismatch between what people are putting on their resume. And that that harkens to the thought of, remember the old job fairs? You know, people would show up and be in person. Are, are we going to hopefully be getting back to that with the pandemic uh, receding or at least not in a we don't have a variant flaring right now? I hope so. That, 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 you know, um, they're, they're, it, these are, uh, our phones are efficient, the platforms are efficient, uh, but sometimes we learn ways to improve the efficiency by going back to the old ways and then realizing what we're missing. The other thing I noticed is how long some of these job descriptions and how lengthy the requirements and some of the demands as described in the advertisement are for the job. And I just wonder if in a tight labor market, if maybe businesses and employers should be rethinking that. In a word, yes. <laughs> concise, right? Maybe being more they, concise. They should try, they maybe, maybe they don't have to make the job description that concise, uh, but but they should err on the on the closer to the one word than you're yeah. right. The Joe, do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's a good idea that businesses communicate to the public what they're doing and why so that we all understand how the algorithms work. I've had a good friend whose daughter just got a internship with Amazon Web Services just outside Washington, D.C. They're looking for people who can program, code, and have good quantitative skills. Now, the payoff is it's equivalent to a job that starts at $89,000 a year, and there's a housing subsidy along with that. Now, you think, why is Amazon hiring somebody who's a junior in college because the junior in college is embedded in this world of technology and algorithms and knew how to put together the resume so that the algorithms would respond. My guess is there's a cottage industry out there waiting to be jump-started on uh, matching up potential employees with employers because right now when you, like, when you go out in the world and you talk to normal folk, they don't really understand what an algo is and why don't you say algorithm? Is there a difference? So yeah, we're gonna to have to do a little bit of education there. And it's gotta start with the corporate sector. Well, we're getting some questions uh, coming in on the chat, uh, more kind of macro economic questions. But before we leave this topic of uh, attracting and retaining employees, Neil, tell me a little bit about the competition between sectors that's aggravating um, the labor issues. What are you seeing? Well, it's, um, you know, at the chamber, we represent virtually every industrial sector, I guess, every industrial sector of the economy. And, you know, sometimes we're talking to uh, employers in one sector and they're saying, well, gosh, I, I think we can go get uh, employees from, let's say, the construction industry, because the skill sets and the, the profile of individuals in that industry um, are a close fit to what we're trying to hire for. Of course, then you go to the construction industry and they're saying the exact same thing about the people in the first industry. And so, um, you know, we're not going to solve uh, the problem that Joe and I talked about uh, just by one industry robbing another industry. Um, that, that's not going to that's not going to deal with the fact that uh, we have demographic headwinds. We have a great reshuffling, a great resignation as a result of this pandemic and uh, employers who, who think they're just going to solve it. Um, uh, by, by acquiring from other places, um, we may not end up in a very good place and we certainly won't be able to hit the growth that our economy has the potential to hit. And Neil, uh, highlight for us some of the top resources businesses can use when they are trying to find workers that the Chamber offers through the America Works program. Yeah, so we have a number of resources available. I, I mentioned earlier this whole idea of um, right sizing or using the right words and 
in your recruitment. Um, that's a program that's run through our, our U.S. Chamber Foundation that's quite useful. Um, we talked about earlier about expanding the pool. You know, one of the, the great untapped pools is the formerly incarcerated, people who uh, have paid their debt to society, uh, but often in the past were overlooked by employers. We actually have a whole guidebook uh, on how uh, your company uh, can explore and best implement practices uh, to take advantage of second chance hiring. Um, there are resources around some of the tax credits uh, that I mentioned earlier. So uh, our message is that there's not one single way to solve this, uh, but you ought to be aware of all of these kind of tools that are out there and available uh, when you think about uh, your workforce needs and how you might try to meet them. Okay, great. Uh, we're getting some macroeconomic questions in. So Joe, I'll turn to you. Um, just kind of setting the stage. We got the minutes from the last Fed meeting yesterday. The big debate seems to be how fast they'll slam on the brakes. Uh, tell us what the expectations are for interest rate hikes, uh, what you expect, and what are some of the key risks you're seeing? All right. So the market's priced in 125 basis points of hikes this year. That means the Federal Reserve is likely to hike the federal funds rate by 25 basis points at all seven meetings they're going to have with risks that there may be a more, a more quicker pace of policy normalization. I think the major risk here is that the, the Fed moves too quickly before we fully understand what's happening. I mean, I mentioned earlier, we don't want to get into one of these either or discussions, either the Fed's accommodative or they're going to crash the economy. Look, even if the Fed were to hike the federal funds rate by 50 basis points at the March meeting, the real federal funds rate is still negative, which is incredibly accommodative. It's just less accommodative. You're going to see this work with the lag primarily through a tightening of financial conditions. So as the Fed hikes, you really won't see the first impact to the final quarter of this year and then next year. And they're, they're going to cool the economy off. Now, second, the central bank's going to use some unconventional tools. They may begin to sell mortgage-backed securities back into the market and to draw down their balance sheet. Now, this is very unconventional. My sense is that they'll, they'll get it to around $100 billion a month by the end of the year, about $600 billion net reduction in the balance sheet this year, and then $1.2 trillion in each of the next two years. That won't get the balance sheet back to the pre-pandemic level, but that will clearly signal to financial markets that the Fed is serious about reimposing price stability. What that means is, is that the long end of the curve will rise, and if we don't increase the supply of homes, Homes are going to get a lot more expensive, and that will cause some problems for buyers, new buyers in particular, and buyers down market. So I think everyone out there should expect that the Federal Reserve is going to attempt to get the federal funds rate, and that's the conventional policy tool, that's their policy rate, back to around 2.5% by the end of 2024. And I think that's a reasonable set of expectations. And there's no reason why the Fed should intentionally crash or derail the economy. It's just not necessary where we're at right now. We have a question uh, regarding inflation. Uh, Joe, do you agree that we're not really comparing apples to apples with the current consumer price index numbers versus those from 40 years ago? Well, yeah, because the structure of the economy has completely changed. If you were using the metrics we used 40 years ago, you'd be making a significant and serious policy mistake by over tightening. Look, we're, we're in an economy, roughly around 80 to 85 percent of it is in the service industry. The tech industry has completely changed the nature of this economy. And as we move forward, it's important that we incorporate that into policymaking. Neil, do you agree? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, one of the great things that uh, particularly the the official uh, uh, scorekeepers, if you will, in government struggle with is the composition and substitutional effects. Um, you know, the economy changes uh, more quickly than uh, government record keeping can even adjust for. And so um, that's not a that's not a, a dig on them. I think they're doing a remarkable job of trying to adjust to that. 
Uh, but Joe's exactly right. The composition of the economy, uh, the reliance on services. You know, that said, I would say that we shouldn't be sanguine uh, about the inflationary pressures and threats. Joe made a really important point that I want to come back to, um, which is uh, at the very beginning where he talked about inflation and some of the inflationary pressures that we're seeing today, particularly in durable goods, beginning to fade, but pressure particularly on housing uh, growing over time as that kind of tends to lag. And so um, I think the important thing is not to overreact, but not to be sanguine either. Yeah, you know, the supply chain problems often get the blame for rising prices for inflation. But what are your thoughts on the argument that there's also price gouging going on? After all, corporate profits have increased. A lot of companies have done really well in the pandemic. Uh, what's going on here? I don't see any any evidence at all of price gouging on a systematic basis. As a matter of fact, profits are high. Hiring's very strong. And the only way you get that combination is if you're seeing an increase in productivity, right? What you want is firms to begin passing along those savings and higher wages. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Moreover, a policy path, which seeks to demonize the American corporate sector is the absolutely wrong path to go down. And I think individuals who ought to know better perhaps want to rethink that. Look, when you look at the inflation, it's clustered in energy and industrial services, mostly transportation. Those will ease here going forward. I don't. I think it's very important, not only the Fed not overreact, but it's very important the fiscal authority also not overreact to this inflation. There are ways to address this. Neil was spot on with what he just said around, we gotta start talking about housing a lot more. There's no need to demonize American businesses. We have a few more questions from our attendees about inflation. So let's keep on the inflation track. Uh, won't the continuing out of control national debt impact inflation continuing? Well, we, we spent a lot of money, uh, particularly during the pandemic, to fill uh, the shortfall that was caused by when you have a shutdown, frankly, an unprecedented shutdown national economic activity. Um, I thought Joe said it well at the beginning. That was warranted. It was unprecedented because, frankly, the, the threat economically, the threat of the COVID and the virus was unprecedented. Uh, but now, particularly as we exit, particularly as we move to a more endemic phase uh, of COVID, it's important that fiscal policy get right-sized. So, you know, for example, if uh, Congress is spending money, we need to be focusing on investments that are going to make our economy more efficient. Um, we don't need to be adding additional dollars uh, to fund additional consumption. And so, um, you know, the important thing is to, to get focused on those things uh, that will improve the overall health of the economy and aid to overall growth, not to simply add more kind of fuel to the fire of, uh, of filling in consumption and demand. Yeah, consumption, even in January, uh, was up. Uh, sales were up, retail sales. Uh, even with the Omicron variant, um, people still buying, even with higher prices. Uh, here's another question. What impact do you think pausing student loan payments has had on inflationary pressures? Well, we talked about people having uh, a lot more consumption. You talked about consumption in January. Uh, part of it is because they've had more income and more disposable income. And so, um, you know, often we think of the, the stimulus checks that the government set out uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the, uh, the unemployment benefits that were adjusted upwards uh, during the height of the pandemic. But it's also a case that the suspended uh, student loan payments means that uh, I think on average, the average student loan is something like a little less than $400 a month. Um, that means that that was money that uh, individuals uh, weren't paying each month and uh, either accumulated in savings uh, or uh, spent somewhere else. And so um, that that clearly is helping support the consumption that we've had today. So in turn, restarting the payments will have an impact on the, the amount of disposable income people have to spend, so thus uh, lessening the inflationary pressures? Well, it's I, part of the story, for sure, Darby. I think that it's, it's, it's time to normalize those payments. But look, when we talk about inflation, 
too often we talk about inflation in one way that we think it's the 1965 to 1985 variety. We've had five great inflations prior to this one since World War II, and each of them were very different. And I want to restate that it's a mixture of not just demand issues, but also supply issues. And typically what I find is when you talk to the public, they talk about demand and they talk about government spending as if it was the, the Great Society plus the Vietnam War. And that, that went on for, for, for many, many, many years. We're dealing with a short two-year uh, re, a response to a 100-year crisis. What we're really still dealing with is, is the issues around the supply chain, those disruption of industrial supplies and the result of the, the, the price of, or increase in the price of energy, which could get worse if Russia invades Ukraine. So it's important that we calibrate policy going forward. With that in mind, this inflation is very different from the last bout of inflation, which was 1965 to 1985. And I would urge all of us out there to, to look at our balance sheets, look at our businesses and see where the, the, the pricing pressures are. Again, we decompose the data. I mean, it's all clustered there in energy and industry, industrial supplies. Uh, we have a question that as long as the current energy policy continues as is, won't inflation stay and impact other parts of the economy? No. Look, the inner U.S. energy industry has been a mess for the better part of 10 years. It was put on an extreme diet by those who finance uh, exploration. Oil production literally peaked in 2017. Prior to the pandemic, the U.S. economy was energy independent. We produce more than we consume. And in the last year, over 50% of the oil we imported was from Canada. Most of you out, out there don't know that we only imported about 8% of our oil that we use from the Middle East. The structure of that industry shifted significantly. And moreover, the problems in the energy industry appeared well before anybody ever mentioned the term ESG. It's not necessary, necessarily policy by the federal government that's caused this. It's been a lack of exploration and an increase in supply. Now, when we talk about the economy and you talk about inflation, there are things that can be done. Typically, it's three things, right? You can raise rates, you can raise taxes, or you can wait it out. When we talk about commodities in general and industry and in, or the oil industry in particular, well, you know what the solution for high prices is? High prices. What's going to happen here or what's happening? As prices approach $100 a barrel, which is just another number, by the way, it becomes much more easier to engage in speculative um, exploration. And you're going to see a lot more production out of, say, the Permian in West Texas, right? And that, that's going to help on price. But we're not going to get back to uh, you know, $50 a barrel simply because the oil market remains tight on a global basis. We still have not yet recovered back to pre-pandemic levels of supply, right? But with prices at these levels, that'll happen soon enough. Investors are watching what's going on between Russia and Ukraine. If Russia invades Ukraine, uh, what impact could that have on the U.S. economy? Joe, you wrote about this recently. So we put together and subjected the U.S. economy to a shock uh, from a, a geopolitical crisis that involved sharp increases in the price of oil, natural gas. And here's what we found in terms of growth. On the growth side, it's really not that bad. If we saw a 20 percent increase in the price of oil, meaning it moved above one hundred and ten dollars per barrel, you'd only shave about one percent off of growth over the next year. Right. And that's got to do with the fact that the U.S. is a fairly large producer of oil and some parts of the economy, like where I live in Texas, they'll benefit from that. Right. Now, where the problem is that will feed through into top line and core inflation. We estimate that, a, again, a, a greater than two to three standard deviation shock to the oil market would result in an increase of 2.8 percent in inflation, which on a year over year basis would take it above 10 percent. Now, is that an economic problem? If it were to persist over the long term, sure. These geopolitical conflicts, they tend to be short in nature these days. It's more of a political optics problem than it is a problem for the economy. But nevertheless, no one and no one, no one will like and no one should tolerate inflation at those levels. And that's why the Federal Reserve is going to get moving on policy normalization 
And that's why people like myself and Neil are urging the federal government to even thinking about meeting the long-term solutions around the housing issues that we're facing, which are real supply problems. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about housing. We talked about that in the pre-call a bit, and um, I know that housing inflation is a big concern. There aren't enough homes to meet demand. So, Neil, I'll, I'll pose this to you. What do you think government, both local and federal, can do in, to address this problem in terms of tariffs and permitting, steps like that? Yeah, every uh, our three level system, federal, state and local, all have a role to play here. You know, at the local level, uh, the permitting process simply drags on too long in too many places. We have too many restrictions on density where uh, we could build multifamily housing or build housing uh, more closely together. You know, it's the old NIMBY, not in my backyard. Well, eventually you run out of other people's backyards uh, in places that jobs and populations are located. And that's what's increasingly happening across the United States is that uh, we're not building housing stock uh, where it is most needed. You can move to the federal level. And some of the things that the federal government's doing is adding to the cost pressures, particularly on new construction. Um, so if you're following, you know, it takes a lot of lumber to build a house these days. If you follow softwood lumber prices, the tariffs that the U.S. has imposed on them um, were uh, pretty frothy in terms of uh, where we sit there today, or not frothy, I should say, just elevated. Uh, and you know that adds to the price of a finished home. Uh, the supply chain problems that Joe talked about absolutely are hitting the housing sector. There's a great story, um, I think, out earlier today about uh, uh, builders who can't get uh, garage doors uh, shipped in to finish a home. And so they're literally selling homes without garage doors because that's better than not selling the home at all. I think that applies to other sectors, other components of housing as well. And these are all things that we have to address uh, if we really want to meet housing demand. Yeah, that story really brought it home. I, I guess better the garage door is missing than the front door, but still, you know, mm -hmm. you, you get you build a new home, you want to have uh, everything completed, but people are finding they have to wait. Uh, so okay, let's just one, one, one other thing on that. I'm building a home right now in Austin. And right now, one of the things that's going to get in the way of the move in is they can't deliver the equipment to monitor electrical usage because they can't get the supply of chips to make, make them quick enough. They're having problems getting condensers for the air conditioners, right? So the, this is really going to be something. You know, over the last three years, completions of homes, which is different from permits and starts, but completions is average between 1.2 and 1.3 million. We've just been stuck in this range for about three years. We really need to increase the stock of supply in the housing industry for the good of the real economy and also to on the margin to address some of the challenges around inflation. And it's going to require, again, the overcoming of the not in my backyard crowd. And you know, it, it, it easing of zoning and local ordinances, having the federal government take those tariffs on Canadian softwood lumber imports to zero. I keep very good track on what we're spending. And yeah, it's, it's expensive, right? And it would have been a lot less expensive had that been normalized earlier this year. But here we are. And I think this is going to be a priority going forward. And this is inherently in the interest of the American commercial sector and the American real economy. We have a question from an, a listener who would ask for more explanation about why a service economy is more inflation proof than the economy of 40 years ago. Okay, sure. So once you digitize something, right, think about the way in which we used to rent movies. We buy them at Blockbuster. Now we just download them from Netflix, right? Once you digitize something, the marginal cost of reproduction, distribution, and access tends to fall to zero. At that point, you not have inflationary pressures. In a digital economy, you have disinflationary pressures. Moreover, we all know that just about every couple months, we get updates on our phones, on our computers. Those software updates, they increase the quality of what you do. They increase the output of what you do, but they are free, right? The digital economy, which is quickly overrunning the old manufacturing economy and is the primary driver of growth, operates on a different logic and has very different properties that drive it. 
Um, that's why the service-based economy that's evolving over time is not going to be inflationary in the way the economy that was once was dominated by manufacturing 40 years ago. We had a, we had a, we had a closed economy dominated by manufacturing where wages were driven by union contracts. We have an open global economy driven by digital where only less than 9%, I think, of the entire workforce has union contracts that dive, drive wages. Therefore, we have a form of demand pull inflation, but we don't have a form of what we call wage push inflation that really defined 1965 to 1985. Neil, any thoughts on that? The differences between no. now and four decades ago? Well, Joe hit it on the head with the digitization and what we're able to do with technology. Um, I, I know he agrees that, you know, that doesn't mean that all sectors of the economy, service sectors are, are immune from the pressures. You know, we started out this conversation talking about uh, worker shortages and some of the labor pressures. Yeah. Um, we just uh, signed the, at my home. We, we're not building a home. We have a home uh, that, that we built some years ago, but uh, the, the lawn service, um, uh, we just got a letter from our uh, lawn service provider, uh, the biggest uh, price increase uh, he's ever uh, had to ask for uh, because he has difficulty um, getting employees to uh, to meet the customer demand that, that he has. And so uh, you will see it in some places like that, uh, but we are overwhelmingly benefiting from uh, the fact that we have the modern, uh, wonderful technology that's helping provide a counter pressure uh, on on things like like lawn service and and goods. So Darby, let me let me throw this out there. This is a little bit of a, a economic gearhead thing, but if you look at the CPI in any given month, about one third of the index is actually falling. That's where that structural change is located, and it's there in the data if one cares to go look. <laughs> Well, that's why we have you, Joe, for you yeah. for, to, to, to highlight it for us. Uh, we have some questions on immigration. Uh, Neil, yeah. we've talked about this before. The chamber has called for increases to legal immigration to try to help offset these labor shortages. The question from our listener is, uh, will the changes in enforcement of immigration law and policy continue to affect certain companies and international business adversely? Uh, it could. Um, we're, we're hoping that we're going to see a, a normalization there as well. Um, you know, in recent years, um, there have been efforts to, to frankly create more hoops uh, around legal immigration, people coming in, for example, under uh, H-1Bs or, or H-2Bs. Uh, there have been additional hurdles created on people who are coming in for business purposes, L-1 visas, for example. Um, some of that was a policy decision that frankly uh, began to be executed pre-pandemic. Some of it was a result of, of the pandemic and frankly, the inability to, to normally process uh, routine immigration matters in, a, in an efficient way when people are having to, to work remotely. Um, hopefully we'll begin to see some of the, that latter ease and hopefully we'll begin to make some of the policy choices. You know, there was just good news, uh, frankly, on this front about a week and a half or so ago out of the administration uh, where uh, they made some changes with respect to um, uh, certain STEM graduates and their ability, uh, foreign STEM graduates in the United States, their ability to work for a certain period of time as part of their educational experience post-graduation in the United States. And that's not a permanent solution, uh, but easing up on some of those regulatory requirements does provide employers more flexibility and particularly the ability to maybe keep on an intern or a fellow uh, that they have employed right now who otherwise uh, would be ineligible for employment uh, otherwise. Yeah, I read that the administration made recent moves to increase H-2B visas. Is that related to, to what you're talking about? Uh, in the same vein, it's different. Okay. H-2Bs are, are seasonal uh, workers, uh, including, for example, folks who come in and, and, and do lawn care and nursery work, uh, who staff uh, a lot of um, uh, regional vacation sites, beaches right, uh, right. in one part of the year and um, uh, ski resorts in, in the winter, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, the administration had the flexibility to increase that by 20,000. They use that flexibility 
frankly, it needs to be a lot higher than that. And uh, we're hopeful that Congress and the administration uh, can significantly increase it. On this front, you never hear folks say that there's uh, you know, good news in Washington and bipartisan agreement, but there's actually a, a bipartisan bill pending in the House uh, that would do just that with respect to H2Bs. And uh, I'm hopeful that over the next year or so, it can get enacted. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we have a question about vocational and technical schools. Do you think that they fill some of the skilled labor gap and do any of them stand out? And if not, why? Sure. They can absolutely not fill that gap. Um, I think the mo without picking one vocation or one school approach over the other, one of the things that we're particularly focused on is that um, vocational schools, community colleges, technical schools uh, in a geographic area really need to be aligned with the employment demands in that same geographic area. You know, where we've seen system failures in the past is when, you know, these schools are educating or training workers for jobs that just simply don't exist in the local economy or where there is no demand. Where it works the best is where employers, vocational schools, community colleges, technical schools work together and say, here's our need, here's our demand, here are the skills we'd like people to have. And those local training providers are, uh, and educational institutions are helping people acquire those skills. So I'm less concerned about what it is uh, that, that people are learning or where they're learning it, other than making sure that it's aligned to what the employment opportunities are in a given area. You know, where I live in Austin, Texas, Austin Community College is doing an incredible job of exactly what Neil just outlined. It's setting up curriculum that's aligned with the growth properties in Austin and really in Texas, because Texas is becoming a booming tech center. My partner, Stacy, she's a professor of user design, which is on the on the sort of the decline of technology, business and, and, and psychology. And they actually teach local high school students at the college the skill sets that will provide those opportunities for vocational employment, especially amongst the population that's not likely to go to college for a whole host of reasons when they're in their, their late adolescence. So these things are happening out there. It's good. You can see them and you can see the outcome is changing the, the nature of local economies and changing the nature of local employment. And in many cases, the corporate sector is really the one pushing things and taking the lead and providing the funding so that the local community colleges can do this. And you know what's really exciting here? There's a true bipartisan agreement around this that we need to do this because not everyone's going to go to, to college or get a four-year degree. And for too long, I think that's been part of the disconnect that's caused the, the social polarization and tensions out there. It's not necessarily that we've left these people behind. It's that they're stranded and that we have to do something about that. Do you think there'll be a change uh, since the pandemic around that? It used to be that in this country, you could just get a high school education and go out and, and you could find a job, usually in manufacturing, and you could support a family on that job. Then came the era and the talk where you had to get a four-year college degree, both with the increasing technology of the economy, sophistication. But I'm wondering, um, with the labor market being so tight and the need for workers to fill positions so strong, perhaps the requirement that you must have a college degree may be waived more often in the future. Well, we are certainly seeing employers who are waiving that. But I think if we're looking at even the longer term future, what we're really going to move to is lifetime learning. Um, so, you know, the days of, um, you know, K through 12 education, then employment or K through 12 education, a four year degree and then employment and never back to education uh, are, are likely over that uh, the technology is moving so fast, uh, disruptions in the economy that uh, many of us and, and, and you know, frankly, our kids in particular um, are going to be getting skilled and reskilled and learning new things, frankly, over the course of their careers. Um, and we should really begin thinking about how we support people in getting those educational opportunities, not just when you know they're under the age of 23, but frankly, over the course of their lives. Yeah, I think he kneels on something there about lifetime learning. I think that uh, the context in which these young people are coming of age is 
characterized by high technology, advanced, very sophisticated technology. And we have efficiencies hiding in plain sight all across the economy. We just have to reach out, tap them, and provide the channel for them to, to find the right kind of employment till so they've got the mix of education and on the job experience that will allow them to cultivate those rich and varied lives that we want them to. And I'm not so going to sit here and tell you we're going to go back to high school manufacturing a gold watch after 30 years. That's over. That's that's Ozzy and Harriet stuff. It's not going to come back. But we're, we're, we're going to move forward. And, and I'm, I'm serious about this. There is a hidden pool of talent out there that we just have to figure out how to tap. And as far as that lifelong education, is that something that employers, businesses, businesses should think about building into their um, strategies and their long-term plans as an offering to their workers, both so that they can retain them, so that the workers can feel like they're experiencing career growth and satisfaction? Because when you read articles about why people left jobs, quit, Sometimes it's childcare issues or different things like that, but sometimes it's just they felt there was no growth and that, that they weren't valued. I think that's absolutely right. And I think um, you're going to have not, you won't just have a, a, a more educated workforce as employers uh, focus on incorporating this into their employee plans. But Darby, as you point out, you're likely to have a, a happier workforce. You're likely to have a workforce uh, that is more loyal to the employer. And so, you know, there's obviously balancing acts, there's costs for employers that go on here. Uh, but I think a lot of uh, uh, companies, a lot of leading companies are getting really innovative at thinking about how they provide learning opportunities for their employees, uh, not just at the beginning of their career, but throughout their career and how that inures to their benefit as well. Okay, we just have a few more minutes left. I'll try to fit in this uh, question. This is kind of interesting. What's your take on the risk exposure, financial and legal, that companies will have at the state level with the increased mobility of the employee workforce? And another uh, attendee asked whether there's any possibility that there will be policies in the future to enforce hybrid, either federal or local. Well, I don't know about the enforcement of hybrid. So, I mean, I think I do think this is something that's going to be left to employers. Uh, but the, the first question is exactly right. Um, this is something any, you know, a multi-state employer already faces, uh, that the rules, the employment rules are different uh, in one state versus another. But increasingly, it's also going to be complicated for employees, right? And so um, Congress has been debating for years the right way to allow states to tax the income of remote employees and are they are they taxed in the state that they're actually physically resigning in and doing the work are they going to get taxed in uh, the state that their employer or that their desk is actually assigned in what happens if they happen to move across the country throughout the year um, and you know where where does the taxing then align so there's a lot of things that we're going to have to figure out from a policy standpoint uh, to make it easier for both employers and employees to take advantage of the increased ability to, to frankly work from anywhere. Real quick, it's in our economic interest to create incentives to foster that sort of flexibility and that mobility. One of the missing characteristics of the American dynamic economy that we all grew up with is the lack of economic mobility. And one of the unexpected consequences of the pandemic is is it jump started it again? We don't want to put let that die. We need to we need to put that and move that forward. Is that that's the way to have a grow, a higher growth path and a more optimistic view of where we're going with the economy. And on that note, we are going to leave it there. Thank you so much, Neil Bradley with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Joe Brusuelas, RSM's economist. We appreciate your thoughts and thank you to everyone who attended today both uh, for listening and for entering your questions into the chat. Stay tuned, uh, March 10th is the next Middle Market Business Index report from RSM and Chamber. Thank you so much for being with us and have a great afternoon.